the uh, founder of one of the founders of Singularity University and uh, the Ethernet from Wire, to be specific. And Josh Hoffman, please come up. Uh, founder and CEO of Zymergen. So two amazing, amazing Berkeley entrepreneurs. Every year we do this, I'm just, it's when we sort of look and say, well, who could be our headliners and our panelists? I just never cease to be amazed. And I think one thing Berkeley doesn't do well enough is promote itself and promote their winners. So we're trying to help them do just that. So thank you for being here tonight. So with that, I would like you both to introduce yourselves. I looked at your bios. They were incredibly <laughs> lengthy, and I think it always matters more for, for you all to do this yourself. So Reese actually didn't graduate from Berkeley. I will add some. <laughs> This is a fact I learned tonight, but he's had an amazing career. Can you please just kind of go through your career and maybe I'll highlight some things if you miss them. How's that? Well, <laughs> so I was at, at Berkeley for 10 years, both uh, undergrad and uh, grad school in biophysics. And uh, I was uh, uh, working on uh, using brain imaging uh, uh, techniques and nuclear medicine type stuff to uh, figure out the biochemical defect in schizophrenia and bipolar disease. And so it, it was uh, computational biology in the early days, uh, in a certain sense. And uh, one of the, so uh, five years in undergrad, five years in grad school, and while I was in grad school doing this, my hobby um, was phone hacking. And uh, for those who recall, there, um, outside of Top Dog in Berkeley, there used to be two payphones. And one of the hobby activities was to uh, gather one of the payphones and use various techniques to make free phone calls and call around the world to the other payphone, <laughs> sometimes, several times. And so you could say hello and then hear your voice go around the world. And, uh, and it wasn't very practical, but it was fun. <laughs> and so I, uh, at the time, I, I uh, uh, would go to the homebrew computer club meetings and then uh, started something at Berkeley called Vima, which was uh, for the Macintosh computer when that first came out. And I learned a lot about how phones work and, uh, and what uh, the parts do. And uh, so as part of my hobby, I ended up inventing the way uh, uh, networks or computer networks can run on the phone wires at the same time as the phones. And uh, this evolved into that blue wire you plug your computer into the wall with. And that became a fairly lucrative side business while I was doing school. And so I went to my advisor and said, uh, what should I do? Uh, at the time, it was earning more per month than, than my advisor was making per year. And, and he said, well, young man, if I were you, I would take a leave of absence. <laughs> but I did. Good did you ever come back? Uh, sort of. <laughs> what does sort of mean? Well, I, 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 uh, I lectured occasionally and, and tried to help with the startups. And, uh, and in the business school, uh, they have a, a, the Lester Center, and, and I became a Lester Fellow, uh, which is an entrepreneurship and innovation type of thing. And so I, I maintained close ties with Berkeley, but also UCSF uh, as, as well over the years. And I, I've done a series of internet companies and, and several uh, um, biotech uh, companies, mostly in synthetic biology, uh, in addition to the Singularity University stuff. Can you could maybe just for a moment just tell us about Singularity University? I think a lot of people are curious about what that is and, and what, what you're up to there. So about 10 years ago, we started a, uh, a new uh, uh, thing called Singularity University, which more or less was an idea inspired by TED uh, in that it uh, teaches people about technologies that are changing at an exponential pace and how to recognize those and then apply them to solving problems. And so. An example would be your phone gets roughly twice as good every year. Uh, and so if you use something like a phone to solve something like poverty, um, the, your solution to that problem naturally gets better uh, every year without extra work. And so uh, by learning how to recognize these things and apply them to solving problems, you can pr uh, solve problems at scale. And, and our definition of scale is, is how do you affect the lives of a billion people within a 10-year time frame. And, and it's not really 
possible to do that unless you're relying on and, and deploying uh, exponentially changing technologies um, that, that naturally get better. And so it's, uh, uh, it's, it's been running for 10 years and it uh, operates out of the uh, NASA campus in, in Mountain View and uh, it's, it's mostly internationally focused in that the main program uh, is 90 people at a time that ideally come from 90 different countries, uh, half women, and when they go home, they're encouraged to um, set up a clone of everything that happens uh, here in that country. And the, so this is happening in, in about 100 countries now uh, in that sort of a network franchise distributed, decentralized kind of way. Oh, that's amazing. That is amazing. I'd love to hear more about that later. Definitely. Josh, can you tell us? So I just want to preface this with your background. You were an economist at the Minister of Finance in Uganda, and you're now the CEO of, of, of Zymergen. Can you help us bridge that, please? <laughs> uh, sure. It's all because I attended some BEMA meetings. <laughs> can you hear it's all, it's all because I attended some BEMA meetings then it takes the mic for in you. the late 80s, early, like 88, 89, 90. Uh, I, that acronym kind of thing, I haven't heard that in years. Um, the short answer is just a bunch of unusual happenstances. Um, I'd love to say it was planned, uh, but the sequence goes, um, uh, after I graduated Berkeley, I worked as an economist for the Ministry of Finance in Uganda. I did a bunch of work on financial sector development, went to grad school. Uh, I was going to go work for an investment bank uh, working on emerging markets finance. This was in the early 90s. Uh, and a big consulting firm uh, reached out to me uh, because they, they, were, they just opened a Johannesburg office and they wanted somebody that worked in Africa. Uh, I, liked the, I liked the consultants more than I liked the investment bankers. Uh, <laughs> I later worked in investment banks at all. It's a close call, though, isn't it? Uh, they do different things. I have, a, at this point, a fairly nuanced and not tremendously interesting view of the distinction between uh, investment bankers and consultants. We can save that for more. <laughs> um, but I went to work for a consulting firm. From there, I actually took a job. Uh, I actually ended up working for an investment bank where I led the principal investing business. Uh, spent probably half of my life between the time I was 20 and 40 outside the country. Um, and then came back and was with a partner at a small advisory shop. And we were doing some advisory work for uh, a company that had some roots to Amaris uh, that uh, has had its fair share of struggles. But they'd done some amazing things in automating life science workflows. And I got to know the guys who had developed and built out that automation. Uh, and then it's a story kind of as old as the valley. That company ran into struggles. Um, they still exist, but they their, their prospects are considerably dimmed. Uh, the guys that I'd gotten to know who were really some of the technical leaders, they were tired of laying people off. Uh, they wanted to go do something on, on their own. Uh, and as I got to know them, uh, I realized that what they had done is they had built a platform that allowed you to use robots as a force multiplier for scientists, but still relying on scientific hypotheses, human imagination, to figure out what to do. And as I understood the biology, I realized that actually you could abstract away from that understanding and build something that was a, basically an atheoretic search engine for biology. Because um, the extent that I have a technical background, it's in math. So it was a pretty clear mathematical problem. Uh, and it was a very interdisciplinary problem. And that was four years. and. 400 employees ago. Wow, incredibly impressive. Yeah, I just want to stress too that just like these two guys up here, they're entrepreneurs. Every single person in this room is an entrepreneur. And so uh, I hope you all are having a lot of interesting conversations tonight. Also, I will, and I have a few questions here, but I'm going to turn it over to you all. So start thinking, please, about what you'd like to ask these two guys. So we all have our fond memories of Berkeley. Uh, mine, in particular, is the law school bathrooms that never worked. <laughs> can you tell us about, you know, think way back, right? Some further back than others. Um, can you tell us about some fond memories you have of life at Berkeley? Um, well, I, uh, at my research, I, was, I had a lab at, at, at Donner Lab uh, and a, a different one on Building 55 up at LBL. And what I was doing was making um, carbon-11 on the 88 cyclotron and and then injecting it into people in building 55, collecting the data, and then analyzing their blood and other data down at Donner Lab. 
So they would run the cyclotron all night and make a, a lot of carbon-11 and a couple of curies, and it has a short half-life, 20 minutes, so it disappears quickly, so you have to make a lot to use a little. And, uh, and I had a little scooter, and I would put it in my scooter and scoot up to building 55. We would run the patient and then collect their blood, and I would, uh, and, and we had pet imagers and so forth there, and that's where the, the patient work was done. But then I would take their blood and scoot quickly down to Donner Lab uh, and, and run the, the blood analytics, uh, uh, measuring the, the radioactivity before it all disappeared. And, uh, and this, of course, I was carrying a, a couple of carries of, of um, radioactivity in, in the back of my scooter. In the proper lead pig, I'm sure, right? Yeah, we well, couldn't so you don't cook yourself too bad. <laughs> And, and so I, I, that little route going up and down the hill was kind of a memory for me. Did you ever drop the vial? Uh, no. <laughs> oh my God. I worked at a nuclear reactor when I was uh, an undergrad, not at Berkeley, but an undergraduate, so I know exactly. That's amazing. That would not happen any longer, I promise. <laughs> well, many, many people don't know that under Echeverry Hall, there is yeah. a nuclear reactor that's yeah. been decommissioned, uh, but it was live at the time. And, we would make stuff on that too. <laughs> make all kinds of good stuff. You can have strawberries that never decompose. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Fond memory for you, Josh? Mine are much more prosaic. I can remember, like, I'm trying to remember the number of the CS class where we got to use the spark stations in, in the workstation in Evan's basement, right? And Web. And that was cool because they were incredibly cool tech. And there was a, a classics library. Uh, in Joe that you had to be a grad student to get access to. It was the most astonishing place to study. And so I remember, for me, my fondest memories are probably all variants of that, which is discovering, I mean, that one of the things that I, I think, especially in retrospect, was great about Berkeley, even if occasionally frustrating, was uh, more world-class facilities across more disciplines than really any other place I can imagine. And all of it there for the discovery, but none of it easy to discover, right? And so there's something as an entrepreneur about the kind of the requirement to go figure shit out um, that I think Berkeley engenders. And I have lots of kind of, oh, there's this cool space and there's this professor who does this thing, which, you know, Eric Gruen, who taught a class on history of Hellenism, which has nothing to do with anything, but was super interesting. That, that experience, that intellectual experience at Berkeley was a high point. Very good. Um, I have a bunch of questions here, but I'm going to kind of skip through some because I'm sure our audience has some more, even better ones. But you all have founded many amazing companies. Uh, can you give us an, an example of something that you maybe wish you would have done differently on your process in your company, and what would that have been? Um, well, I, I uh, helped start a, a couple companies on the investment thesis of uh, using um, software, computer science type software development uh, that uh, with uh, reading data, editing the data, compiling the data, writing it back out. Um, applying that kind of workflow model to uh, synthetic biology and living things. So how do you read the genome? How do you edit it in the computer? And how do you print it back out or compile it for the type of creature you want it to run in? So essentially you rewrite DNA with editing and a genome compiler and a, 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 a DNA laser printer. And the, the, the thesis was that uh, the types of techniques that have been uh, developed for how do you develop computer software applications and code uh, could be applied for how do you program uh, DNA and biology as software that has uh, subroutines that are genes, and how do you build living things, which which you do. Um, so that uh, uh, so that investment thesis I still think is very sound, and there's. A thousand little details of how do you make that work well, but I think the uh, the the premise is an area called synthetic biology, which isn't a very attractive name for consumers. Like if you make something with synthetic biology, people don't like that. You need to hire a marketing person. Right. right. So yeah. We call it molecular technology there precisely because we don't like the phrase synthetic biology. <laughs> also, because no investors make any money in synthetic biology, so <laughs> you just spin it a little differently. Josh, what about you? Something maybe you wish you would have done differently? I mean, you've built an incredibly successful company, but I'm sure it wasn't always up and to the right, perhaps? Well, let's be clear. We haven't exited yet, so all success is provisional. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I think the thing uh, 
that I would say is, and, and I'm, I, I don't have the entrepreneurial background in Restep. This is my first startup. I came to it late. Um, I didn't appreciate the extent to which there are a set of norms in getting a company, founding a company, raising seed financing, et cetera. Um, we brought a different set of perspectives and probably I assumed we were a hard tech company. We sit with a real leg in, uh, in machine learning and AI and a real leg in genomic synthetic biology. Um, and I, I think I presumed, I didn't do a very good job of educating early investors about why that combination was powerful <laughs> and the, the scope for it. I thought that it would be obvious um, and I just I did a bad job there, and so our seed round took longer to raise at frankly lower valuation than it probably should have. Yeah, so they, they just not sort of understanding how how sort of things work. It sounds like initially, or how things are sort of done. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to beat ourselves up. It's also the case that we were raising money uh, at a time when basically every synthetic biology company on the planet had just crashed, yeah. and so anything that smacked of that was a hard sell. Um, <laughs> but I think we. I didn't do, we didn't do a great job in uh, in talking about the kinds of opportunities. Basically what we've done is we've created, um, way back when, the reason I remember this is some, some people remember, Yahoo was a human mediated view of the web, right? When I was a grad student, I actually sent a website to a librarian at Yahoo who, who categorized it as like sad grad students mm -hmm. hand coding HTML pages in Connecticut. Um, or something like that. And, I remember that, you can't be. Uh, and this was before the fee. This oh, was, before this was the like, fee, this wow. This was like 94. This was really early. Um, but uh, that approach of human mediation didn't scale as the web group, right? And, and there were all these things that some people, you know, all these web, web browsers like Alta Vista that use, that try to use various kinds of what we would say call AI or ML to kind of replace the, the human judgment. But those didn't scale either. And Larry Page's big innovation, and he really was an innovation, was that you could build an atheoretic web browser, right? A, a link is a vote. And we've tried to build something like that for biology, something that's atheoretic. But we didn't do it. We did a terrible job of explaining why, if you built this atheoretic data-driven engine for designing and optimizing biological systems, why that opens up just tons and tons of applications and why it's a platform. So we didn't, we didn't frame the problem in a way that was amenable to the way that uh, investors could easily understand. From what I've heard, and I, I know this firsthand, but I think Larry and Sergey struggled with that initially also, so I think you're fine. <laughs> they got better seat terms. They got better seat terms than we did. <laughs> did they? I don't know their seat terms. They did. Terms. Um, so just in speaking in general to the entrepreneurs here in the room, you know, hiring, we've heard time and time again, is, is by far the hardest thing that entrepreneurs are struggling with right now, hiring the right people. What advice would you give to founders here tonight regarding hiring and then developing the talent in their company? Well, the, the first company I did um, uh, at Berkeley was called Farallon, which was kind of a spin out of BMUG. And, the, uh, and it, it was my hobby, and it was really, the purpose was to manifest my hobby. And so we didn't, uh, I didn't even think about raising capital for it or even think about, well, what was the long-term objective? And that uh, at the product initially was something that I designed and to give away published how to do it in the newsletter and make little baggy kits from with parts from Radio Shack that we would show people how to make them and make your own cable night. And then people <laughs> said, well, we want more of those. And then companies who came to these meetings, which we used to have in the PSL lecture hall every Thursday at Berkeley, um, the companies came and said, well, we want a thousand of those. Uh, but we don't want kids, we want them pre-assembled. And I said, oh, well, we can hire some undergrads and make these things, and, and we did. And, and they said, no, we want a 1,000 every week. And, and that was the first company, and then more companies came and wanted that. And so the, the building of the company for the, uh, the, the secret was how to uh, price it so that for each one that was sold, there would generate enough money to build three more. And so if you have a 75% gross margin or better, you can grow uh, pretty indefinitely without any invested capital. Um, and so for three years, the company uh, grew to over 300 employees with no invested capital uh, based on this kind of model. Um, and, and even though I had 
friends and mentors who were venture capitalists and investment bankers, and they sort of told me about how these things happened. I didn't really even connect that, well, this was an actual business that was going uh, to scale. Uh, and, and so the people who were hired and attracted to uh, work there and, and uh, uh, were people who were interested in the hobby and the making of it and the doing it and the, and the club-like spirit of, of building the thing. And, and once we connected the computers on, in a room, then we, how do you connect a whole floor, then a whole building, then a, a campus, then you know, to the internet, and then globally, and then how do you manage that? So each subsequent thing was how do you build the next right thing to expand the system to basically build the internet. But the, uh, uh, the motivation was solving a problem of how do you connect everything and not so much, well, how do you get a uh, return on investment? And the, the company, that's, uh, by the 90s, it had gotten to pretty substantial scale, and that's when I uh, uh, decided to uh, uh, recruit in, essentially, a, uh, a board and a venture capitalist and ultimately investment bankers, and the, uh, the first investor and first board member was uh, also the first investor and first board member of Microsoft, who was a, a wonderful mentor and guy who helped you know, uh, recruit the rest of the investment team and the, the network that's required to go public and, and grow from there. Great. And, and yeah, so in terms of hiring and, and recruiting and retaining talent, how did you approach that, Josh? What would advice would you have for you? I mean, my, my honest answer is I was lucky enough to have distinctively good founders, and we started with a really strong executive and founding team, so the problem wasn't ever on any one person's shoulders. It's a lot easier to recruit 70 great people if you've got six strong executives to start with, because each person has then got to recruit a small number of people. And I mean, I, I would love to say that that was foreordained, but that was just luck. I had two astonishing, have two astonishing co-founders, both technical guys with real uh, domain expertise and a certain reputation in the field. Uh, I got we got very lucky in that our CTO, who was employee five, was the first was the first uh, non-founder engineer at Cloudera, and he was a pretty important guy. He's still a relevant important guy in that new world, and so it just it made the whole thing easier. Um, and the only advice is, you know, building businesses is a team sport. There are lots of different ways of constructing a team, but if you think of it as a team sport from the get go, the whole thing is a lot. Very well said, absolutely, the whole thing. Feels is like an unsatisfying answer though. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, 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 you start with an 18. <laughs> but we're all 18 here, come on. <laughs> so, um, so this is my favorite question here. So as a female, I get asked this on every panel I'm on, and so I'm gonna ask you guys. So how do you handle work-life balance issues? Both of you have families. Can you tell us a little bit about that as founders here? Well, my uh, initial instinctual reaction to that is, is what is life? <laughs> <laughs> Because you have no life, right? Well, because it's, it's my hobby, so. <laughs> there you are. I, I mean, I'm, so um, uh, one of my mentors, again, John Donahoe, uh, who was CEO of eBay, uh, and he talks about the fact that, um, and I think it's, it's, it resonates enormously, the idea that you, um, there's this, this false uh, disconnect between work and life, that somehow they, they subtract from each other. Whereas if you think about it, you do your best work, uh, if you're calm and if you're relaxed and if you're feeling nurtured and you, you're most present in your life, if your work is, if you're able to feel calm about work, right? And so to actually not think of them as trade-offs with each other, but as equilibrating mechanisms. If you're, if you're not able to be present for your team, present for your customers, present for the technology you're building, then actually something's probably, probably not spending enough time nurturing other parts of you. And similarly, if you're, you know, at, at your kid's basketball game or, soccer or whatever. If you're if you're not able to focus, if you're not able to be there in that moment, then actually something's probably not balanced at work. And to use that as this this kind of uh, leveling device about where to spend time and not to think about time spent in one as a as a coming at the expense of the other, but rather building a kind of balanced life across the full richness of experience. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think blending is, is the right thing, right? Kind of having them all merge into one. I find some of the best deals at the Cub Scout campouts or the uh, the preschool drop-offs sometimes. So you kind of have it all merge into one, I think is, is great. Those are recruiting opportunities. They are recruiting opportunities, absolutely. <laughs> uh, everything is a recruiting opportunity. <laughs> so, uh, so this panel is supposed to be all about computational biology. 
And I think my understanding of what that word really meant was pretty narrow. So I would like maybe one of you to take the, that term and just tell it to the audience really what comp bio is and what it, what it maybe is not. Or both of you can take a shot because it's pretty broad. So, so it's a little bit like describing what is software. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty diverse, vast area, and, and, and Berkeley has been pretty strong in computational biology for 50 years um, in that using computers uh, at, at the intersection of studying ecosystems to molecular biology to uh, statistics to uh, you know, medical and, and other kinds of biological things. And in the bigger picture, uh, I would say the computer science or the EECS crowd is uh, sort of deterministic in their view of the world. And biology is not deterministic, it's stochastic and statistical or somewhat random. And so the kind of people who are attracted to biology tend to be different than the people who are attracted to uh, analytical computer science. And so very often a team is needed to have, you know, the two different styles of, of people kind of working together on a problem, and and so that the uh, of, of using uh, deterministic technologies like, like computer science to address problems in in biology, uh, and where biology becomes a computing, uh, and and vice versa, uh, where things like social networks are essentially like a living creature in that they've gone, they maybe have uh, deterministic underpinnings of the plumbing of it, but the behavior of a social network is more like a rainforest or an ecosystem where it's hard to predict what people are gonna do or how the news will flow, for example. So what, what is CompBio to you, Josh? Um, can we just say ditto? You can tell me if it's more comp or more bio. I mean, a lot of times we're seeing people throw neural, net, neural nets at everything, right? And massive data. And that's what we're kind of seeing in the venture world. But for you, from your perspective, is it more comp or more bio? And is that, yeah, that going to change? I think the most interesting stuff is the stuff that is comp and bio. I guess my perspective on this, and this is kind of deeply rooted in the almost religious philosophy that, that's part of how we the company, so you got to correct for that. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing I would say is that the pure computational methods for understanding biology are, uh, at least today, uh, I'm pretty bearish on. The systems are incredibly underdetermined. You know, uh, we know so little about what happens inside a cellular metabolism. We have so little understanding of even the basic syntax of a genome. We aren't able to track the environmental conditions in which biology, I mean, it's just, we, we don't have the starting conditions to model it in silico, um, on one hand. On the other hand, I think the biologists are, um, there are huge advantages in statistical rigor, statistical techniques, the precision in manufacturing that's gone into the modern silicon age that are real lessons for biologists. And I think, so I think the most interesting things happen uh, not, not in a kind of more comp with a flavor of bio. I'm personally somewhat, uh, and I think this may be a little controversial, I'm short-term bearish on some of the precision medicine uh, efforts because I think there's just so little we understand. Um, but I'm also uh, short-term bearish on uh, traditional rational drug design efforts because again, I think there's so little we understand. So I think the most interesting stuff comes when you're able to do what Reese talked about and put a team together to, to think about tackling some of these problems in ways that integrate both aspects, right? So for us, that's around how do we think about partitioning the genome so you can search it most efficiently, right? Taking a mathematical framing of a quite complicated, stochastic, high-dimensional problem. That's, a, that's an interesting framing. There's a ton of technology, both of the webware and the software that goes into being able to instantiate that. But I think those are the kinds of things that are most interesting. And I think we're gonna see more of those things in the future. Very good. This is gonna be my last official question and then we're gonna open it up to the audience. So as you said, Berkeley has been a leader in comp bio uh, for at least 50 years with companies like Zymergen and Caribou and, and technologies coming out of Berkeley like CRISPR. What are the most interesting trends in comp bio for you all, and what should we be excited about going forward? What should we be looking for in investing in starting companies? Oh, well, uh, in this uh, uh, deterministic and simple to complexity and, and uh, stochastic um, distinction, the, um, like, like for example, you can write a gene circuit on a computer and say this gene does this and this and this, you can write ORs and AND gates and all these kind of things. 
And you can make the gene, the DNA, and you can put it in a simple creature, uh, like a, a prokaryote, and odds are it'll kind of do it pretty well. But as the creature becomes more and more complicated, like if you want to put it in a yeast, um, it, it seems to have more free will, and that free will of the creature seems to be related to its complexity. So if you put the same gene circuit in a yeast, which is 10 times more complicated, or a mammal, which is a thousand times more complicated, uh, it, it says, well, if it's sunny today, I'm not gonna run your program. And, and if you gave me more sugar, maybe I'll run your program. But um, it, there, there's some sort of undetermined dynamic of, of the biology, the living thing, uh, exerting its, its kind of unwillingness to run your program, the more complicated it is. And, and humans are quite complicated, and ecosystems even more so. And so um, this general thing, uh, uh, George Church has a term that he used called uh, natural computing, where um, the, we understand biology so poorly that we can't simulate it very well, and that it's much easier to build it, put it in, in a million different versions in a million different creatures, grow them and see which one performs the best, take that one, clone it, work from there, make a million more and more, and, and that the, you can uh, debug your program um, much faster than you could simulate the same thing uh, in a computer by, by building millions of versions of, of creatures and, and sort of deep, uh, sorting it out that way. And, and that uh, computation and the, and the sorting process that's happening in biology, uh, some people call it natural computing as opposed to digital computing, um, that is, is you know, computation happening in life. Um, so that's kind of what we do. So that's <laughs> uh, um, I, I think the stuff that, so I would say three things that I think are super exciting. Um, one on the pure computational side. I think for lots of reasons, uh, deep learning and the kind of Jeff Hinton techniques have gotten a ton of press, but they're not the be all and end all of machine learning. There are lots of really interesting <coughs> Formal machine learning techniques that are uh, use different kinds of data, often much smaller data sets. So I'm actually pretty excited about efforts to go back. And deep learning, by the way, was like dead. I mean, it was you'll know this more than it was like first written about like in the '70s, right? Um, at least the, the mathematical ideas, right? I, I'm pretty excited, and we're doing a bunch of interesting stuff with other quote older techniques that aren't as sexy. And I think I think thinking about how uh, non-trendy algorithmic techniques can have use cases beyond recognizing cats and dogs, I think is pretty interesting, because biology, the kinds of things we do in the best of the world doesn't generate data of the, it, it's big in some ways, but it's small in other, and deep learning techniques are only so, so. So I think there's a bunch of cool stuff happening as we plumb the archive, as we plumb the archives for, for older techniques, one, two. I think this is just an explosion of genomic tools. We're seeing a ton of cool stuff happening, and how many of those are gonna end up being standalone businesses versus purchased by somebody else, I, mean, I can't say, but I think there's a ton of cool stuff there. And I think as you see companies start to be, uh, hit kind of profitability inflection points, there'll be natural acquirers for those tool stacks. So I think there's a, a ton of super cool stuff happening there. And then lastly, I think, um, and this is something where I might push the venture capitalists in the room, because I'm not sure it's your natural way. I think there are tons of use cases for bio-based products that are outside the kinds of things that Silicon Valley understands and knows well, but are hugely impactful and profitable. Um, and I think... Uh, what kind of things? <laughs> imagine if you could make animal feed that doesn't require farmers to use antibiotics, right? And reduce waste in, in animals. That would be massively, be a huge business, massive margins, well, depends on our price, probably massive margins, um, would affect a billion people uh, but doesn't, but requires understanding end markets and value chains that the Valley doesn't understand. Um, if you start to think about uh, what's the uptake on a novel polymer, how does that happen, right? I, I would argue that, uh, this is a, again a little bit of a controversial view, but I would say that the petrochemical revolution in the first half of the, end of the 19th century, first half of the 20th century, was one of the greatest increases in human welfare ever. And yet, we've sort of lost a sense of how those products were adopted and that, that adoption curve. Um, it doesn't look anything like a social network. But I think there's 
a ton of those kinds of applications that are not biology as either therapeutic or as replacement for stuff that's made via petroleum that I think are super interesting. I'm gonna let the PT talk, I can't, it's not working, hello, can you help me? <laughs> I'm a former CPG person, so I'd love to talk more. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you both. This has been incredibly interesting. I've, wait, hold on. We have questions from the audience. Um, we have time for a few questions. Please uh, raise your hand, and I'll have Jenny come to you. Do you want to? Or can you just? I think we can probably hear you. Can you stand up and speak loudly, or would you like a mic? Uh, go ahead. Back to you. The woman back there. You are. Yeah, you were standing up. Go ahead. share about your, uh, the journey you've been on. Um, I, I guess I would say, well, like, I, I think that now is actually a relatively good time for comp bio. That's the only time I disagree. I think there's a lot of focus on it. Um, this is where I'm not in market as an early stage company, so I've, I've heard there's been some pullback in the early stage market. I would say that I think an increasing number of tech-focused investors have built up some chops around life sciences. Um, and we've got a great investor group, and I know lots of others too. So I feel I feel like folks are uh, are amenable. I, I guess the thing I would say is have a path to revenue, right? I mean, that's the thing that I think we did right, I think is super important. And that's the one thing in the, in the story you told that I guess gave me a cautionary that I sort of, I, I think it's very easy for scientists to want to go get NIH grants or uh, SBA grants. Um, but I think that that ultimately takes you away from the discipline of figuring out what your product is that you're going to sell you to your customer and why it's going to create value for them. And there's nothing like getting revenue, right? It's the thing. It's the only thing. And if you have if you have customers and if you have revenue, you'll get funding. I mean, I'm just it'll be a pain in the butt. It'll take longer than you want because you're absolutely right. Like the tech is hard to understand. But I think if you can show revenue growth and you can show real customers that are paying real dollars, that's. That ultimately is the thing that no investor can can say no to. Yeah, I, I, I would strongly second that. And I just want to tell you, too, that hard to get funding is a blessing and a curse, OK? It's hard for you now, but what you can rest assured is 50 of your competitors are also not getting funded, right? So so that so that so that's a harder space, right? And, and investors come around. I mean, when we started looking at healthcare IT, it was 09, and nobody was doing healthcare IT. In fact, I had funded a healthcare IT company and had the same issue, like is it tech, is it life science, is it tech, like how do you get this company funded for the next round? And now everyone's doing that, right? So um, so what I think you just really need to do is focus on people who, you, there, there are people I'm sure that do a lot of theses in this area, and, uh, and I'm sure Jed and I would love to talk to you afterwards, potentially, and that you really focus on those specific investors, and it just takes a lot more research when you're in that kind of zone to figure out who to talk to, but there are those out there. 
And then, um, and then just be glad that you're, you don't have 50 other companies just like you getting funded, right? So it is a double-edged sword. Next question. I think you had a question? Yes, you. So currently there's a lack of talent that truly understands <laughs> So I actually think you don't want people to understand both. I'm going to push back a little bit on the concept. I think that the skills and experiences that are required to write scalable uh, enterprise software, those are pretty unusual set of skills, right? No, I mean, even, even basic judgments. When do you refactor versus when do you commit? Like, that is not, that is not taught in any class anywhere, right? You only learn that by doing. So I think, I think and again, this is the approach we've taken, so please, you know, I'm saying this to your experience, but I think you. what's more important is to build a culture that allows you to put these folks together and a language that allows them to talk to each other, because I think the, the specific skills and experiences, you're unlikely to get somebody who does both well, and in fact, you're gonna get kind of a crappy scientist or a crappy software engineer, and I'd rather have great software engineers and great scientists, and then my job as a founder, my job as a leader in the company, part of an executive team, is to create the culture and the processes, and I use that word, Advisedly, that allow them to interact and, and talk with each other. But I just think the disciplines, I mean, Reese talked about it really, they're so different and the mindsets are so different. And in fact, there's great stuff comes out of that tension. I would agree with that. They, um, the, um, there actually are more than two disciplines where to do um, so, sort of the synthetic bio stuff well, you need a, a robotics person, you need an optics person, you need a computer science person, you need a biological person and, and, and those people have different personalities from my experience and that and there's not very many people that can cross over any two of those combinations so you need kind of a team of five uh, to do anything substantial at scale and that's um, uh, I don't know if, if that can be taught for somebody to be expert in all five of those things um, I, well I think just to build on that and even within it's, it's I think very easy to say there are scientists and there are software engineers, right? The software engineer who builds your data infrastructure is different than the software engineer who's writing your ML algorithms, right? It's still different from the person who's writing the abstracted workflows that sit on your robots, right? These are these are real, and this is one of the challenges of anything that integrates software and webware is that the technical disciplines are real. I, I'm not a believer in the kind of AWS model of biology. I think that the protocols are not abstracted enough, and I think the underlying space is, and I'm gonna borrow this from it's too stochastic. So I think it's, it, it is absolutely, you wanna not just figure out the team you want, you just wanna figure out the sequence of the team, right? Going to get an ML person before you've actually got like enough data to be searched in a reasonably consistent and partial way, it's just gonna be frustrating for everybody. Sounds like a very fun problem, actually, working with all these different kinds of people and trying to stitch it together. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, what the other question? Yes, please, in the back. Hi, uh, my name is Tatanko. I'm with the Work Angel Network. Just following on her question, so I've been following Kong Bio for the last 15 years, and I still remember she went genome sciences from way back when, and they basically just failed and become a therapeutic company. So my question is for all the Kong Bio companies that I'm looking at, what would your advice be for them as to what business model is? which is you should build a business that you think is going to be, you know, uh, you should go out for opportunities that, that look like they've got both attractive growth opportunities and the potential for some inflection point where you think you can make a reasonable EBITDA margin and over time the multiples will sort themselves out. Um, I just think that, I think that you can spend a lot of time trying to think about how to position a company for a kind of multiples arbitrage and I mean, again, 
the market for search engines was closed, and then Google went public, right? Like, and they went public not because people thought search engines were trendy, but because they were making a boatload of money, right? And so I think if you find something where you can make a ton of money while building great technology, you're going to be fine, and you'll be fine across market cycles and across pricing disciplines. I mean, the therapeutic companies look great, and then they fail a phase two trial, and they drop by ninety percent. I mean, that's pretty. That that is a risk profile that is very appealing for some individuals and some investors and not for others. I, I would just say that uh, startups are hard and that 90% uh, of them fail and Y Combinator's uh, uh, failure rate is 93% and they're selective at who they they take in and two-thirds of their companies don't even get to Series A. And so the you have to factor in that kind of dynamic when people are doing things um, and one of the ways that, that it keeps a company going is if you actually get some kind of paying customers early on, and that uh, early on, unless your, tech, your technology is, is so ex extraordinarily breakthrough, um, early on, in a sense, if you can provide a service or a partner with another company that needs what you're working on and get some revenue flowing that way, and then f focus, you know, the attention onto the high value add part as opposed to more and more service. Then you get a higher multiple of, of valuation. That, uh, um, but one of the things that's particularly hard if, if it's a medical thing that requires FDA approval. Um, there's there's a sort of a binary success fail where you can invest a lot into doing something, and it's not until you get into clinical trials that. It, it may succeed or might just fail. Um, and so, you, in, in which case, you've invested a lot and, and you have a kind of a, a great success or a catastrophic fail. And the big pharma companies are used to playing that game and they're used to the amount of capital that's required to do that. And, and so, if the early stages of your partnering in a service type way is also uh, something that plugs into a big pharma company, then you have a natural partner to, to grow the business at scale and take that bigger risk when, when it's needed. And one of the problems in like a, you know, founding entrepreneurial CEO types naturally have to be very grandiose in their thinking in order to become brand later on, because if they're not, it won't ha happen. And so the problem is grandiosity is also a delusion. Um, and, and so it's, it's a little bit of a balance of, of how do you work that up. So I'm hearing you say play with house money instead of putting everything on red. Is that okay? Um, I had, there's a question over here in the plot. It's, it's about 715. I want to respect people's time tonight. So we can, uh, how are you guys doing? Do you have a couple, couple more questions? Is that cool? Okay. So you please, and then we'll take one or two more. My name is Andrew. I'm a recent graduate from UC Berkeley, and I have a startup in Um, what do you make of all of the consumer genomics companies that are coming out of uh, really everywhere? Um, some of which are really not founded in science. And I, do, you, do you think that there's going to be a, a kind of a blowback in the future where you know, people realize you can't pair your line with your genome? Uh, you can? Wait, hold on. <laughs> people will try to convince you. It, it's a little bit like phrenology or <laughs> numerology, where now you can go to Illumina, buy a machine, and run people's genomes for almost nothing. Um, and so instead of it being a really expensive, difficult thing to do, lots of people can do it. And the, the entrepreneurial thing is, well, we can read your genome, and that must be useful. But uh, there, the, the research has shown that people can have a gene for something and, and not get it, or they can not have the gene for something and get it. And so it's not necessarily that um, uh, correlated of uh, what your genome sequence is versus disease. And when you get into diet and behavior and dating, like you know, like the original concept of 23andMe was find your ideal mate through your genome sequences uh, for breeding. You know, um, but the uh, um, so th so there, I, I think there will be a, just like in astrology and phrenology and numerology, there was a shakeout. You know, that people thought this was the greatest thing, and then they were disappointed, and, and the, the companies that didn't have substance to what they were doing uh, didn't survive. I mean, I can't find my match by my cards. I'm very, okay. 
Anything else on that? Terms of okay. Uh, one more question. Michael, you had a question. You've been patient. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm an investor in the house. I thought it'd be really helpful for the entrepreneurs for you guys to share a story of some great advice you've gotten from an investor that you haven't taken, and what was the re result? And that you wish you would have, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, and, and what was the result of not taking their advice? <laughs> and it could have been you didn't take it, and that was a good thing, and that, that could, it could be either way. <laughs> In like 1976 or 77, Henry Kister asked Joe and Lai uh, what he thought of the French Revolution, and his answer was, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> oh, so it's, yeah. it's kind of too soon to know. I should have taken some of that advice or not. That's fair. I mean, I think, I, I think the, 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 the places where I think we found the judgment calls to be the most difficult are the speed of growth versus proving out the tech trade-off and how to do that um, and how to think about playing, how to think about marketing, right? We have, we are, we are, we sit in a place that's gotten much trendier over the last four or five years. There's a bunch of people that are hyping themselves crazily. We've done very little of it. Um, some of that is just we're not a so we're not good at it, but we're a very deeply technical organization. Deep technical people tend to kind of care about truth in a way that doesn't necessarily lend itself to TechCrunch articles. I for sure have investors who argue that we should develop better marketing chops. Um, there have been times when I've thought that that was right. Um, but I think, I think all these things are compared to what, and, and sometimes what is the opportunity cost of your time, right? If I had spent more time trying to build up a marketing organization, Maybe I would have spent less time making sure that our software engineers and our bench molecular biologists were talking to each other productively, and I damn sure know which of those two I think is more valuable over the long term. Yeah, well said, very well said. Sometimes the advice is fire the CEO, <laughs> and, and that so sometimes the investor is right about that, um, and other times um, it, it turns out not to be the right thing to do, that the, the uh, the part of the problem is, is the founding CEO is, is usually very passionate and has deep insight into what they're working on. And most of the core team, especially the technical team, kind of believes in that person and is aligned with that person. And even if they're messing up and they're stumbling, that they, uh, uh, like putting in some random MBA to take over their job isn't necessarily gonna make things better and very often it makes it worse. And so the, uh, um, like how to solve that problem, uh, like the first reaction will fire the CEO, uh, that kind of thing, you know, building a stronger board and a mentoring and a, and a kind of work-life balance and helping, uh, you know, develop the, the CEO and the founding team, um, from my experience, is, is something that um, deserves some weight because you know, the counterbalance to that is this, the CEO could quit. Um, and so that, uh, like CEOs, founding CEOs of startups are, are on average deathly afraid of being fired. And, and they don't realize that if they quit, the company would end too. And so it's kind of like a Mexican standoff or Russian roulette <laughs> or something that, um, that, uh, that these things are, uh, starting and running and growing a company is an art, it's not a, like, decisive science of do you feel that just on that do you feel that do you feel that the valley's investor base has changed in the way they think about founder CEOs over time because I've never maybe I'm not self-aware enough but I would <laughs> definitely fear of being fired but I also have incredibly supportive investors because you quit. <laughs> no I think it's more because I have we we have been lucky enough uh, to get investors who are supportive of the vision we're trying to build and where we've messed stuff up. They've offered support and, and you know, criticism and they've never been shy about it, but they've been very supportive of, of us as a founding team. And so, but I, I kind of get the sense that 20 years ago it wasn't quite that way. So I'm wondering, given your history, whether you've seen that change. Well, I think the obvious example of Steve Jobs kind of is you can point to that and say, well, look, that was the fire room was the wrong thing, and, and to bring it back was the right thing, and and the, but not very many companies get that second chance. 
Um, but sometimes the right thing is, is that person is is freaking flaming out, and and you you do need to bring, you know as a board and an investor base and, and a team you need to uh, try and figure out how to to get the ship back on track. And I'll say as an investor, and I was back, I was around for the first dot com kind of thing on the other side, right? And I do think things have changed, actually. And now it's the biggest nightmare any investor can have is having to replace the CEO. It's sort of the, the eventuality that you don't want to ever have to deal with. And so, one thing that I tell all my founders to do right away when we fund a company is to get a coach and get a really good coach. And the favorite thing my C the CEOs usually say is, God, you know how expensive that is? I'm like, you know how expensive a CEO search is? <laughs> and the likelihood of that? And so I really push hard for them to get a coach that they connect with, that can give them good direct feedback, that can kind of go and go to the board members, go and do th sort of overall 360s. Don't get one of these coaches, it's like a corporate therapist. Get a coach that'll do a 360 for you and really help you understand it because they're, really, they're in your court 100%. And I mean, Steve Jobs had a coach, for God's sake, right? And, uh, and I meet a lot of resistance to that, but every time people do it, they're like, oh, I'm really glad I did it. And so much so I even got a coach, right? That I, I saw so much um, progress in the CEOs. And so we want to see people go all the way through to a public company or sale, and so that's a better way to ensure that happens. Okay, another question? Yes. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you for your time tonight. Um, uh, and it was <clears throat> really nice hearing about your background. Uh, I started off as a consultant, went to an iBank, went to the buy side, um, and now I'm a, I've been an entrepreneur for co-founding and now at a company. Um, my question is, uh, going from a very rigid structure in your career uh, to a much uh, more green field uh, in the startup world uh, is interesting, it's fun, but I'm curious if there's one book or movie, fiction or nonfiction, that totally changed your worldview uh, and helped open up your mind that, that you could share? Um, there's a book called Be Here Now, which is not a business book, and it's not an entrepreneur book, it's a philosophy, um, Buddhist kind of book, but it, it uh, um, gets you to reassess what's important. Um, so I would say, uh, one is a book, and then one's a, a set of classes. So there's a, and they're related. There's a, 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 a French cultural uh, historian school called the Annales School, and uh, there's a, a famous historian there, a guy named Fernand Rodel, and he writes these sweeping cultural histories. And his whole point was that great men and events are the froth on the waves of human history, and and it takes you away from history as a kind of individual directed thing and to, to focus on these underlying social and technological trends. And that changed the way I thought about how stuff rolled out over time. So that's on one hand. On the other, um, when I was in grad school and taking uh, taking really, well, undergrad in grad school uh, and, and studying stats and coming to appreciate how easy it is to differentiate, or sorry, how hard it is to differentiate luck from scale uh, there's just a lot of stuff that's happened for everybody in this room that's just luck. Like, we are the most fortunate people you can imagine. And to, to not lose sight of that, either on the upside or the downside. Sometimes we get stuff wrong because we just got unlucky and you shouldn't beat yourself up. And sometimes you're not quite as good as you think you are and you shouldn't take yourself too seriously. So you put those two things together, kind of a real awareness of a probabilistic outcome, coupled with a sense that individual efforts are not necessarily all they're made out to be. It doesn't lay off the hook for trying hard. Uh, working hard, but for me, that those two things paired have been pretty important. Okay. I think. Yes, yeah. but, but if you like philosophical books, there's another one called Finite and Infinite Games, which is a book about game theory, and that it helps you see the world in a different way. In that, it sort of teaches you that most of games you're playing by the rules, and you're following the rules, and the um, and in an infinite game you play with the rules, you change the rules. And that if you can recognize that distinction, uh, and, and for example, the co-founder of Cisco, uh, Sandy Lerner, said uh, as, as that company was rebooting, she said, well, the first thing to know about a game is to realize that you're in one. Thank you. I think that's a great quote to leave it on.
You guys have all please a round of applause for our two and three. Thank you again, Jacqueline. And uh, is there still wine out there?